Okay, hello, welcome to today's um, question and answer session. Um, sorry about the noise outside, there's a bit of roadworks going on as they're getting ready for the opening of Eaton Fair, so hopefully that won't be too distracting. Um, today we've got a question that I want to start with. Um, so this is submitted by Marsha, um, saying anything I can do about my puppy's libido. He's 10 weeks and kelpie. Uh, my four-year-old inside cat doesn't get left alone if they're within the same room or area. My cat is male and desexed. So I'm guessing from that question that the puppy is basically humping the cat, um, which is quite a common thing for puppies to do. Now, it's important to note for puppies, this isn't a sexual behaviour. It's um, really they don't start to feel testosterone until they're at least seven or eight months old. Um, some breeds, like your larger breeds, are going to be even older than that. So there tends to be other causes for this sort of behaviour. And it really goes into to two main classes that, that we get. There's dominance behaviour and there's basically hyperactivity um, behaviour. But occasionally we do see this with submissive dogs as well. It's, it's a way to sort of test the water with another animal and see what they can sort of get away with, I guess is the way to put it. Um, so to really work out the best way to approach something like this, it's important to know whether it's a dominance behaviour or whether it's a hyperactivity sort of um, disorder. And a Kelpie, most commonly it's going to be hyperactivity because they're very, very energetic dogs and they either need to have a way to get rid of that energy or they'll find a way themselves. Um, so if it's a dominance um, sort of behaviour, then we look really towards um, look doing our basic dominance sort of um, uh, behaviour modific modifications. So most important thing, in, and really for either of these products, for either of these problems, uh, training is going to be very important. Now, for, for dominance, what we're looking to do with the training is to really establish the owner's role as, as the top dog. So basically, teaching the dog that the owner tells it to do something and it does it. And Training, I think, has to always be reward-based rather than punishment-based. So it makes the dog want to actually listen to the owner and, and do what the owner says, rather than the owner basically forcing the dog to to, to do what they what they ask. So certainly structured um, training programs. Um, basic dominance things that you should be doing with it, every dog basically is making it earn any attention or anything good in its life. Um, so if the dog wants attention, if the dog wants food, it has to earn it, and that. And it could be something as simple as getting it to sit or those very sort of basic behaviours. And that way it stops the dog from getting into a, a sort of situation where it feels like you can just come and demand attention from your demand food and, and get it. It has, has to earn it. And that reinforces your position as being the provider of all things good. Um, what we also do is we look at, I guess the way to really look at things is how the dog would be in, the, in a pack situation. And in a pack situation, the bottom dogs get everything good, good last and don't necessarily get everything kind of good that the, the top dogs get. So a similar sort of thing, um, food, if food is important for the dog, um, then make sure you eat first and then the dog eats and that just establishes your place in the pecking order because in a, in a wild pack, the top dogs would eat and then the other dog would, would come in and, and sort of have what's left effectively. Um, don't allow the dog on bed or couches or basically any sort of elevated position which effectively puts the dog on the same sort of level as you. So it's the sort of thing where if you don't have any dominance issues, there's no great problems with, with letting them on the bed or on the couch if that's what you choose to do. But while there are dominance issues, keep keep the dogs down on the ground and, and below you and, and make sure that they know that the couch or the bed is a good thing. But because you're the top dog, you get it, not them. Um, also feeding, um, don't leave food down for dogs with dominance issues. Right? In dog world, there's two things that are really important. It's generally attention and food. So getting attention, like I said before, make sure they earn that attention. So a very basic um, command that they have to follow. With food, if you leave the food down, it weakens your position as, as the provider of everything. So if you have if you give the dog discreet meals, the dog really has it reinforced that you're the one who's providing that food and it's not just something that just happens to be there. Um, now, if it's a hyperactivity problem, we really do look at mental stimulation as being one of the keys. In the very short term, when the behaviour is happening, so if the, if you're kind of walking and the dog's humping the cat, uh, what you really want to be doing is, is trying to distract the dog. So sometimes sharp noise just to break that behaviour. Um, never hit a dog, never kind of use physical punishment because that's when you're going to end up with a fear biter or you're going to end up with a real, really problem, real problem dog. Um, but also the dog has to learn that these behaviours are inappropriate. There's not necessarily an inbuilt kind of knowledge of what they can and can't do. So make sure you give them a chance to learn. So when you find the behaviour, distract the dog, sharp noise to break the behaviour and then try to find a toy or something for it, for it to play with. So that you basically redirect that energy 
away from a, a sort of a negative thing into a positive play situation. Um, and training is going to be really important and training should be done, pretty, pretty much any dog should be training quite frequently. Now puppies are like kids, they've got a very short attention span, so ideally you want to be doing a couple of short sessions a day rather than doing a longer session and try to um, basically try to leave the dog wanting that a little bit more. Um, training is going to wear a dog out just as much as physical exercise, um, so that's where we, we do really need to have that mental stimulation, I guess, um, the way you, you can put it, I mean, it, it sort of works both ways where you need sort of both. Um, you put a marathon runner in a, in a five-star hotel, they're going to go absolutely stir crazy. And same with if you have someone who's kind of really into their sort of mental stimulation, kind of like their problem solving and things, and you might put them on a treatment all day, but they're going to be bored out the brains and going to start to get that negative behaviour as well. So that's what we're looking at. Other things that you can really do to, to help stimulate the dog's mind, one of my favourite toys is called a Buster Cube, and it's basically a... a, a treat cube that you put their, their biscuits into and the dog learns it has to roll the, um, roll the cube around to, to get its biscuits out and that basically once again is a good mental stimulation so each meal can then take 10 or 15 minutes for the dog and it has to be constantly thinking how do I roll this cube um, to get the food out as quickly as possible so that's a great thing to do. Um, other toys, I mean, things like tongs are always good, you can stuff them with the biscuits and leave that out for the dog. Um, you know, on the hot days, you can even freeze some biscuits or, or not so much biscuits, but if the dog likes carrots, for example, you can freeze that into an ice block um, and then the dog spends a fair bit of time trying to you know, lick the ice block down so they can get, get to the carrots. All those sort of things kind of, with the real kind of help that mental stimulation so that the dog's not getting those destructive sort of behaviours. So I hope that answers your question. Um, so start off by working out which sort of problem it is, whether it's a dominance issue or whether it's a hyperactivity issue, and then follow those steps and, and see how you go. And if you've got any further questions, certainly get back in contact with us. Now, another thing I wanted to talk about today is vaccinations in dogs. Um, this has been inspired by us already seeing a couple of parvo cases this summer. Um, we're going to see a real peak in the parvo cases over, over the summertime, and that's for a couple of reasons. One is dogs are just out, out and about a lot more and so there's more exposure to, to these viruses but also we start to get people coming down on holidays from Perth and surrounds and they bring their dogs and that potentially introduces the viruses into the environment again. So vaccinations really, they're an absolutely critical um, thing. We've seen so many pathway cases over the last few years in particular that really if you have a dog you need to be getting your dog properly vaccinated. It's, it's not something that should be seen as, as sort of an optional extra. Um, we see, I mean, over the last couple of years, we've probably seen some kind of into the hundreds of parvo cases. Uh, so a basic vaccination protocol for dogs, we recommend start the absolute minimum vaccination is what we call the C3, which covers against parvo distemper and hepatitis. So we recommend every dog gets those vaccinations because they can pick up those diseases without direct contact with infected dogs. Parvovirus, for example, is a very, very contagious disease and can live for up to about 12 months in the environment. So your dog could potentially go walking somewhere that a dog with parvo was six months previously and pick up the disease. Now, dogs with parvo virus infections also shed a huge number of, of virus particles. And so those virus particles can easily get on the shoes, clothing, things like that. And so they can actually be transported back to the, to the home environment. So we have seen cases before, and actually probably almost half our cases, owners report the dog doesn't actually leave the backyard and hence they didn't get them vaccinated. But it appears that either the owner or someone else has transported that virus on their clothing or on their shoes back to the dog and the dog's become infected. So even if your dog doesn't leave the backyard, you still need to have it vaccinated. And really the, the cost of vaccination is less than having your dog, it, or certainly a lot less than having your dog treated for parvo. I mean, the parvo cases, they can be anywhere from $1,000 to $5,000 to treat. Um, even euthanizing your dog with parvo virus, you're going to be up for a couple hundred dollars. So a vaccination is cheaper. It's, yeah, it, it should be done for, for every dog. So the basic vaccination protocols, the protocol we recommend here is in line with the uh, World Small Animal Vet Association and, and the Australian Vet Association guidelines. So we recommend that the parvo separate hepatitis components are given at six to eight weeks of age, 10 to 12 weeks of age, and then again at 14 to 16 weeks of age. Um, after that, we give a vaccination around 12 months after their 14 to 16 week vaccine, so at around 15 months. And then we give the parvo separate hepatitis components every three years. The old generation vaccines, everything needed boosting every year. The new generation of vaccines, we know that they last for at least three years, so we know that's a safe, safe um, protocol. It's 
one of those things, vaccines are very, very safe. We very, very rarely see a problem with um, with vaccination reactions. So there shouldn't be a great paranoia about vaccinating, but we do try to minimise um, vaccine use to, to really what's appropriate for the individual. So that's why we go to that three-year interval if the dog is heavily exposed to parvo. So, for example, there was another dog in, in its immediate environment that developed parvo. We'll probably go for a year to boost it for a couple of years just to make sure it's, it's completely covered. But otherwise, really, a three-year um, vaccination interval is, is appropriate. Now, the vaccines that we use allow for early socialisation. So what we generally look at is around 10 to 14 days after they've had their 10 to 12-week vaccination, they can start going out and, and sort of seeing the big bad world to a certain extent. Now, it's, there isn't, it doesn't provide 100% protection at that age, but what we end up really needing to do is try to balance off the behavioural benefits of early socialisation versus the very small risk of picking up these viruses. So by getting them out at that 10 to 12, or after that 10 to 12 week vaccination, what it means is they, they can learn a social behaviour because really it's up until about 16 weeks of age that dogs learn how to interact with other dogs. After that, it would be equivalent to sending a teenager out into, into the world having never really experienced other people other than immediate family. They really wouldn't know how to interact. So that's why kids, it's important to get them out and, and socialise them. Exactly the same with dogs, get them out while, while they're young. So using those good quality vaccines are, are important. Now, some vaccine manufacturers do say that you don't need to give that 14 to 16 week vaccination. Um, I worked at a practice once which stopped doing that 14 to 16 week vaccination and we actually had five dogs come down with parvo that had had that early finish without that um, final vaccination. So really we do strongly recommend that 14 to 16 week vaccination. I've never seen parvo in a dog that's had that proper puppy course of those three vaccinations. So it's very, very effective for parvo. I mean, you can pretty much guarantee if your dog's properly vaccinated, it won't get parvo. Um, so that's... The real, that they're the essential components. Every dog should have that pathway to step on hepatitis vaccine. Now, the optional extra is against kennel cough, and kennel cough, I mean, we're calling it canine cough rather than kennel cough now because we don't tend to see it very often in kennels because pretty much every kennel insists, insists on the dogs being vaccinated against kennel cough. There's very few dogs that, that will take into the kennel environment or actually pick it up. Now, kennel cough vaccination isn't 100% effective. It's very similar to the, to the flu vaccine in people where you certainly reduce your risk of picking it up, but if you do pick it up, it's generally a shorter duration and like lower severity. So it is still recommended for the dogs that are that are meeting other dogs. So at times we recommend it. Um, going to kennels, it's, it is required in pretty much every kennel and most kennels won't actually accept, accept your dog if you're if you're not properly vaccinated. Now the first time you have the kennel pop vaccination it does take around 14 days to work. So make sure you plan ahead. Excuse me, if your dog's going into a kennel you have to vaccinate it at least a couple of weeks beforehand if it hasn't been vaccinated previously. If it's had, had its full vaccinations previously, including kennel cough, you can, you can give them a booster right up until the time they go in, just making sure that they are fully up to date by the time they go in. Um, so we normally start off with the kennel cough at the 10 to 12 week vaccination, and we normally use an intranasal vaccine. And the reason why we do, or two reasons why we do that, it means they need a single dose when they're puppies. So instead of having to give two, two doses as we would by injection, we can give a single dose. And it also means that it's working a, or it's working a lot quicker. So within four days of that intranasal vaccine, we're starting to get effective immunity against some of the, uh, the components. Um, also, what we what we tend to, to find is, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. There we go. Um, is we can get something called humoral immunity, where basically if the body's exposed to a disease process or a vaccination by its normal path of infection, um, so for Canada, for example, it's a respiratory tract infection. So if the vaccine is given by a respiratory means, then we tend to get better immunity because the body effectively learns to recognise it in that context rather than if it was given by injection, the body wouldn't necessarily recognise it quite so quickly. So that's why we tend to go for that, that vaccination. Um, after that, it's, there's a booster every 12 months. So the technology for the chemical vaccination hasn't really improved in terms of I mean, it is more effective than it used to be. Um, the old vaccines only used to be six months and then 12 months, but at the moment it still does need that 12 month, uh, 12 month booster. But that ties in well with the annual health checks because the, one of the most important things with annual you know, vaccinations was that annual health, health check. So it, every dog should be brought in and checked um, every year. And that's really something that we've, we've been very proactive on because one of the problems we can see with dogs that are only being vaccinated every, every three years is if the owners don't bring them in for checkups each year, then quite often we find that any diseases 
uh, quite advanced by the time we see them. So we see uh, in dental disease or lumps and bumps, so different tumours, whereas we might have picked them up at an annual health check if they came in on an annual basis and got them at a point where we could easily treat them. By the time it's it's kind of potentially two to three years down the track um, from when they first developed the problems when we see them, quite often it, it's gone past the point of e easy treatment, so the treatment either becomes less effective or more expensive. So those annual health checks are really important. And like I say, we tie it in with the chemical vaccination. Um, if we do, the other thing we do look at tying in with those annual health checks is heartworm injection, and that's something I'll cover in a separate um, separate webinar. So we can talk a little bit about what why we recommend um, heartworm prevention, what heartworm is, and, and what we need to do. Um, so that's really our main vaccines that we look at for dogs. There are some other vaccinations available. I mean, you can get the tetanus vaccination, but tetanus is very very rare in dogs. Um, rabies and other things we're not really exposed to, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if, if we have a specific problem, coronavirus is another um, virus that can cause diarrhea in dogs. And some people believe that the really severe parvo um, infections that we get relate to dogs that get parvo infection and coronavirus at infection at the same time. We don't tend to see much coronavirus locally. So once again, we don't tend to recommend it. Very much what we look for for our vaccines is vaccinate what's appropriate for each individual dog rather than have a blanket policy if we should get vaccinated everything. We should be vaccinating every dog against the, the four diseases, so part of it is and hepatitis, and everything else is really done on an as-needed basis and, and when it's appropriate. So that's that's the focus of any vaccinations. Um, so thank you for uh, watching and listening today. Um, tomorrow we'll be answering any questions you might have again, and we'll be discussing cat vaccinations. Thank you. Bye.